Hey, hey, hey. Time for another Out of This World story from Our Space. When it comes to grief, there's no how-to guide you can follow word for word. Your experience will be uniquely yours. Today on Our Space, we hear about a tragedy surrounding addiction. Cheating wife ruined family in Christmas. Why does she expect me to be okay with her behavior? If you're familiar with the original story, please use the timestamp to navigate updates. My wife, 37 female, got a new job four and a half months ago. She also made some new friends. I, 36 male, didn't really like them. They were all hardcore feminists, professional victim, social justice warrior types. They are women who will yell at you for opening the door for them or not opening the door for them. You can't win either way. In the beginning, I sort of laughed it off, but during the last two months, I noticed some disturbing changes with my wife. We have been married for 11 years and have two kids, 10 female and eight male. It got worse and worse. She would accuse me of all kinds of nonsense. Like I was born evil because men suppress women historically. Say like, what? Whatever I did for her, things she would normally appreciate was all of a sudden reasons to have a fight. It was all nonsense. I would try to be patient. These arguments would usually end with me saying something like, but I haven't done anything bad towards you. The only thing I am guilty of is loving you. It would usually send her murmuring. Then the next day, she would be back trying the same thing again with slightly different arguments. Then about five weeks ago, I got this sharp gut feeling that something was seriously wrong. She came back late at night without telling me she would be back late. I couldn't reach her phone. She was rather drunk and she acted distant and cold. The next day, she would just be dismissive and tell me I was being controlling, that I read too much into things. This happened a few more times. I tried to snoop on her phone, but didn't manage to find anything definite, but I suspected she had deleted a lot of her messages. I did find a thread with one of her new friends. They were discussing how she would approach me asking for an open relationship. I immediately knew what my instincts were telling me. She was cheating. In the thread, my wife said she would talk to me about it on what is now the second Monday of December. My kids are with their grandparents to celebrate Christmas, where we scheduled to both join them today. So anyway, she tries to start this conversation during breakfast, like it's just a thought out of the blue, to ask me what I think about an open relationship. Luckily, I was prepared. I was already recording. I had been reading a lot here on Reddit, and I knew there is really no way of saving this. My best possible outcome is to get out of this with some sliver of pride and self-esteem intact. From here on out, it's all about protecting myself and the kids. I didn't scream or yell. I just went directly into jaw clenched interrogation mode. She was all cocky up until this point, but that evaporated immediately when she saw the look on my face. Who is he? What do you mean? Tries to look innocent, like she didn't understand. If you want to have this conversation with me, don't treat me like an idiot, and at least you can be honest. If you can't be honest, what's the point in this conversation? What do you mean? If you lie to me now, we cannot have the discussion you want to have about our relationship. I can tell that you are hiding something. It's obvious. So, who is the guy you are screwing? I am not. Oh my god, it's more than one. Uh, uh. Don't. Just don't effing lie. You have just totally destroyed my trust in you. I can tell you are lying. Either you are honest and we walk this through, or I divorce you. Our marriage ends right now. No arguments, no discussion, no nothing. Just divorce. Do you understand? But. Say it. Do you understand? Do you understand that if you lie, I will divorce you? Say it. Do you understand that I already know a lot? I can read you like a book. If I catch you lying, we are over. Tell me you understand. I, I, I understand. She proceeds to tell me about two one night stands while out with her friends. I ask about their names, if they are married, if she wore protection, etc. They are both married men with kids. Then she tells me she is planning to sleep with a colleague at work and that she intends to pursue this since it's good for her and that I don't have any right to control her. What the F? I ask about the colleague as well and get his name, his wife's name. He is married, but according to her, in an open relationship like she wants us to be. She continues that she will set me up with some of her friends. One of them are really keen, apparently. What in the actual F? I have seen this friend and I wouldn't touch her with a barge pole. I tell her I am not interested. I ask for her phone and she shows me the pattern to open it. While she went to the bathroom, I locked myself in my office. She freaks out, and while she was banging on the door, I ran recovery software on the phone for deleted content and ended up with lots of painful evidence 30 minutes later. I also installed a spying app from an online service. When I came out, I gave her the phone and told her to leave. She argued a lot. 
I didn't really respond beyond single word responses. She didn't seem remorseful at all through all of this. She was yelling at me that I was acting controlling, holding her back like men always held women back, that I never loved her, that she had every right to do this, that she expected me to just accept this, that it wasn't a big deal, etc. I didn't argue back. I hardly said a word, actually. I just packed her stuff while she circled, yelling at me. I ended up at the front door where I just stood silently until she ran out of steam. In the end, she reluctantly went to her parents' house. On her way down the stairs, I told her she was single now, so she could do whatever she wanted. I wasn't controlling her anymore. My lawyer would be in touch in January. When she turned to respond, I just slammed and locked the door. I later watched as she discussed it with her friends. They were telling her how strong she was demanding what she was entitled to, how she deserved better than me, that it was empty threats from my side, that I wouldn't go through with it. You want to bet? What really worried me was how they told her that if needed, she could just accuse me of domestic abuse. One of them explained how she had screwed over her ex-husband and taken everything from him by accusing him of abuse. I have ordered cameras to put up at my house now. I know now I have to record everything. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I have never even threatened her in any way. Then she started messaging her affair partner to meet up. They agreed to meet at a hotel. I was absolutely stunned. I went online trying to find the affair partner's wife. It didn't take long. I got her to accept me as a friend on Facebook and I told her everything, including the ongoing activity at the hotel. She thanked me and hung up. A few hours later, I got a video from her. She went to the motel and confronted them. From the screaming, this wasn't the first time her husband had cheated. You effing a-hole. You did this to me again? To the kids again? I told you we were over if you ever did this again. You beep. She walked into the room and filmed my wife getting dressed on the edge of the bed. I threw up when I saw that the first time. The affair partner's wife slapped her and cursed her out. I sent a message to my wife telling her that I saw the video from the hotel and that I never want her near me ever again. It's like she sees our interaction as some sort of pissing competition where she, in her mind, is winning. She's totally delusional. I can't understand any of it. It's like she isn't connected to reality. Like she doesn't really understand that we are divorcing. I logged into my wife's family WhatsApp group and informed them that we are divorcing due to her infidelity. I thank them for making me feel welcome and part of the family before disconnecting from the group. I have received a few calls and messages from her side, but I haven't read them or responded. I just don't have the energy for it. I called my parents and told them everything. My father messaged my wife that she wouldn't be welcomed for Christmas. I'm at my parents now and I have talked to my boss. He has given me time off until January to sort my things out. I have been monitoring my wife's increasingly frantic discussions with her new friends. I don't think it's dawned on my wife that she has lost her family, that her marriage is over, and that her new friends and her affair partner don't really give a crap about her. She has sent me many messages and showed up at my parents' house, demanding to be allowed to celebrate Christmas with us. My father threatened to call the police if she didn't leave. Now I'm Googling divorce lawyers, crying my soul out. I think I've been in shock, but the pain has hit me hard since I got to my parents' house. I just can't make any sense of it. It just gives me so much pain to read their chats and interact with her. I have only responded twice to her messages. The first, it doesn't matter what you say. I don't know who you are. You're not my wife. My wife would never destroy my heart and soul while smiling. We will get a divorce. I don't care what you say or what you want. You have no influence or right to demand anything from me ever again. We are over. The second time, like I said, you are not my wife. I don't know you. My wife would never condemn our children to the pain and suffering of growing up in a broken home. You, whoever you are, seem to be proud of what you have done. My wife was loving, caring, considerate, my best friend. You are a self-obsessed, self-absorbed abomination. The message stopped after the last one. The pain is absolutely unbearable at times. I wish this never happened. I wish I could get back with her like before, but I just can't do that to myself. This is the worst Christmas ever. I couldn't help myself, but I explained to the kids that mommy doesn't want to be a family anymore. She wants to be with other men and that we will get divorced. They are naturally distraught. Luckily, my mom and dad are here to help. They shower them with love and affection while I am an absolute mess. I will try to get back on my feet for my kids' sake, but I am not going back to her ever. I wish I waited until after Christmas so I could get them straight into counseling. I don't know what happened. I just blurted it out when they asked when their mother was coming home. I would never be able to look at myself in the mirror if I went back to her. The level of disrespect and callousness in her behavior is unforgivable. I am lost. I just don't get it. Why is it that she expects she can demand anything from me at this point? Is she mentally ill or something? Sorry about the incoherent rant. I just needed to get this out. Edit. I found out that I am okay with the monitoring. I talked to a lawyer that a friend knows. 
The phone is mine and the subscription is mine. My wife is using it, but I own it and the subscription, so I'm okay. It's not illegal to monitor my own equipment. Wow, OP, I'm so beyond sorry. It sounds like your wife is going through an identity crisis. She is easily swayed by those around her, which makes me think she feels quite lost. She's looking for answers, and these new friends of hers seem to be taking advantage of her weakened state. With this in mind, it's no excuse for her to go out and cheat on you and disrupt the family dynamic. If she had issues with you, she should have communicated those feelings with you right away, just as you've been transparent with your children. I think it's important to be open with kids to an extent. I don't think you've told them anything you shouldn't have in this case. It helps teach kids what's right and wrong. Let's read on. Update. So a lot has happened since I last posted. I'm sorry that I haven't answered anyone or given an update. To be honest, I haven't had time to even read all the responses. There are so many of them. A lot has happened. I wish I could take credit for it, but the truth is, I have been a pathetic sobbing mess since I last posted. I was sort of obsessed about my wife's chats with her friends. A lot of insane and hurtful things were said in these chats. What got me in the end though, was when my soon-to-be ex-wife described, in very harsh language, how her marriage and especially her children were a burden in her life, that they had prevented her from being a successful woman, living up to her full potential. She described how I, as her husband, was an oppressive piece of crap that held her back from living a good life. Her family was the reason she didn't have a successful career, loads of casual sex, etc. I just broke. I couldn't handle it. I spent the next 30-ish hours reading and rereading every line of emails and chats I had over and over and over again. On reflection, she didn't provide any details on how we actually were burdens or oppressors. It was just blanket statements, no examples or supporting arguments. In fact, I have never stopped her from doing anything. I pay for almost everything. The minimum wage she collects from her part-time job wouldn't be enough to support anyone actually. I have supported her hobbies, dreams, and aspirations, even when she did stupid effing class after stupid effing class that she would always drop out of halfway through. I made sure to show her I love her every day and appreciate everything she did for the family. I would romance her, take her out, be there for her whenever she needed me. I mean, if this is oppression, I would like some oppressions, please. Anyways, I digress. At some point reading, I just passed out. When I got up, my three best friends were in the kitchen with my dad making dinner. I've known these guys since I was a child. Let's call them Mike, Bob, and Frank. My dad had invited them and brought them up to speed. I soon broke down again and I was completely out of it until Friday evening. Mike is ex-military. He lost his left arm below the elbow. We were actually all there for him when he was in recovery and his wife bailed on him. Luckily, they didn't have any children. Mike has adopted two kids and got a very nice girlfriend a few years ago, so he did okay. He set up a Zoom call with his counselor that helped him when he went through recovery. He helped me a lot to understand what was happening with me emotionally. Even though he specialized in amputees, he told me most wives sadly bail when their husbands are injured, and his stories and examples helped me a lot actually. He asked me to see my soul, identity, spiritual self as having a large part of it tied to my marriage and role as a husband. That part is dead now, and just like an amputee will suffer phantom pain in missing a limb, I will feel phantom pain from the dead part of my identity. We spent hours talking and I have been steadily improving since. Bob is an executive in some IT security company. He never talks much about his job. I don't actually know what he does, but he is very well off. Bob called some law firm that is on a retainer for the company. And Sunday morning, I was talking to a lawyer that I could never in my wildest dreams ever afford to even talk to. Bob has always been a huge nerd and was bullied a lot. He told me not to worry about the bill. He would cover it. He was happy to finally be able to repay me for the beatings I frequently took for him interfering with his bullies. Frank is a teacher in a private school for kids and is married with seven children. Yes, that's right, seven. My kids just love him too, and the rest of his family to death. Frank has been making sure my kids are okay and cared for while I get back on my feet and get my ducks in a row. Yesterday was a very hectic day. It started with an STD screening early in the morning. The ugh, gave me chlamydia. Another screen in six months. Ugh. My self-pity party switched to pure effing anger when I found out. That's it for me. Gloves off. Full custody. I will give her nothing if I can get away with it. The lawyer managed to track down the ex-husband of my wife's feminist friends that bragged about how she screwed him over. It was apparently very easy via the court documents. I wouldn't have even thought about that. I talked to him on WhatsApp. He thanked me a lot, but he also told me about everything this heartbeat did to him. Now I know what to expect from my soon-to-be ex-wife. It was sickening. I was ready for a fight. After our chat, I am preparing for war. 
It was heartbreaking hearing how he had been homeless and how he had hardly seen his kids in four years, all based on the ex-wives' lies. I accept how I'm at a disadvantage as a man in the court system. I will make sure I have tons of evidence. My lawyer suggested a preemptive strike via a restraining order due to her negative and aggressive comments about males in general, especially for our son's sake. Growing up in a household with an openly anti-male parental figure is obviously very damaging. So I am going for full custody. I told the lawyer to go ahead. She expects her to be served the restraining order today. I had a call with my soon to be ex-wife on Zoom. Keep in mind that she hadn't reached out to me at all since she showed up at the door to argue with my dad. She hasn't reached out to the kids or anyone else either. So it's not like she cares about any of us. The call was absolutely bizarre. She was all made up with a massive cleavage. It was obvious she was trying to look her absolute best. I haven't seen her that dolled up for years. Throughout the entire conversation, she tried to bait me into a fight to get me angry. I managed to keep cool. My lawyer had told me what to ask for. Apparently it's very positive if attempts are made for an amicable divorce prior to filing for a contested divorce. I was recording it. I even told her I was. Still, soon to be ex-wife didn't disappoint. She started out with this absurd statement about how there are two types of penises. One that is roughly the same size, whether it's erect or not, and the other type that shrinks and grows based on whether it's erect or not. What in the actual, who opens a call with her husband like that? Then she mused about how she was looking forward to the end of the current restrictions so she could go out and investigate this more in person. I simply responded that I wasn't interested in her hobbies, that I was only interested in discussing our divorce. She got openly hostile when I didn't take the bait and get angry like she wanted. At one point, she told me she was going to the bathroom and muted herself. Then I watched as she conferred with her friends about what she could do with me. She cursed me out for nothing more than being a man several times. Throughout the call, I still had this strange feeling that she was seeing this as some form of game, that she was in control and that I had no other option than to put up and shut up and give in to anything she wants. We made zero progress on our actual divorce, so I concluded that, okay, fine, a contested divorce it is then. By the way, you gave me chlamydia and unlike you, I haven't been sleeping with anyone else, so you better get yourself to the clinic. She just frowned at me like, yeah, right, I don't believe you. I seriously have no idea at all what is going on with her, and at this point, I no longer care. I sent the recording to the lawyer, and she was shocked to say the least. Everyone thinks my wife is insane at this point. Maybe she is. Since I own her phone and the subscription, I can actually use the chat logs as well in court. Turns out, it's fully legal to monitor my own device as much as I want. After our call, there was frantic discussion between the harpies, but I could finally put it aside. I no longer care what they talk about. Lawyer is confident we will win this thing unless there is something I haven't told them about. So there we are. It still hurts, but I can treat it as phantom pain at this point. I have abandoned feeling sorry for myself and I'm going for the jugular, no prisoners. I need to protect myself and my kids. I am good. My kids will be fine. I will make sure they get therapy as much as they want. My soon to be ex-wife will soon be a distant memory and I will start building a new, better life. Edit. Found out today that she knew about the chlamydia and got treatment, but didn't tell me. That woman. She was joking and laughing with her friends about it. <sighs> it's so easy to fall into that obsessive state when you're checking in on your wife and gaining evidence, OP. We tend to cling on to those things because we're trying to understand why the infidelity happened and where it all went wrong. It's also so hard to see what someone is saying about you behind your back. She's a hurt and resentful person looking to hurt those around her. All I know is that she should have communicated to you what she was feeling when the things initially started and not waited for something totally catastrophic to change her life. It's often hard to reach out and ask for help though. Let's continue. Update two. Firstly, thank you everyone for all the feedback. Apart from the hacking adverts disguised as comments or PMs, I have blocked those. I get a lot of feedback like, I am strong or winning in some way or somehow getting out on top. Rereading my posts, I can see that my anger towards the situation filters through and I can seem defiant and sure of myself. Truth is, I am not. I wish this never happened. I wish my family was still intact and that I had a long, lazy, comfortable life ahead of me with my wife as the kids grow and start their own lives. No one is the winner here. My wife has gone off the rails and the entire train is burning in the ditch. I don't know what is wrong with her. She refuses to see a medical professional for possible mental issues, and she is acting like nothing is wrong. Still, she shows no remorse or regret. She acts like I am unreasonable for not just accepting whatever she wants, and she has hardly even talked to the kids since D-Day. I am divorcing her, taking action and moving forward with separating our lives because I have to. Her behavior has left me no choice, and by now, 
There is no way back. I wish so much this wasn't necessary. I can never trust her ever again, and I cry myself to sleep every night for my own loss and the fact that my children will not grow up in a broken home. It also breaks my heart that my children, in reality, no longer have a functioning relationship with their mother. Question. How do you answer this question from your child? Why doesn't mommy want to see me anymore? Doesn't she love me? How the heck do you answer that? If anyone knows, please let me know because I sure as hell don't. Every day I wake up and tell myself that my heart is already smashed into so many broken pieces that it can't possibly break anymore, only to be proven wrong all day, every day. My wife still doesn't know that I can monitor her communications, or she doesn't care. She is 100% convinced that I will never leave her, and that my reaction to her behavior is totally unjustified. She keeps talking badly to her friends, about me, our marriage, and our children. I don't understand why she hates us so much. We haven't done any of the things she accuses us of doing to her friends. As I mentioned before, my lawyer won a temporary restraining order against her. There was a hearing yesterday morning, and since there were no new direct threats, it wasn't extended. My lawyer suggested using the fact that she knowingly infected me as a threat to try to get her to agree to an undisputed divorce. I wish we could separate in a reasonable process. I hate the fact that I have to see her as the enemy and always assume the worst possible outcome. If she wanted to leave me, I would be able to live with that, but why force me into this extremely adversarial process? Why does she do her best to hurt people that used to love her as much as possible in the process? What possible gains can she have from this? I would appreciate any insight on this. It just doesn't make any sense to me. If I go to court, I will probably have to pay her a lump sum for the equity in her house, etc. I will probably not be liable for alimony, and since she doesn't show any interest in the kids, I am hopeful I will win custody of them if it goes to court. Anyway, my lawyer suggested we try to get her agreement for an amicable divorce. I agreed and we will meet with my soon-to-be ex-wife and her representative, hopefully this week. The ex-husband that was defrauded by the lying harpy spends New Year's Eve with me and the kids. The injustice of the justice system against fathers is just incredible. Now I have no delusions of receiving a fair process if we go to court. His ex lied her head off and the court just took it as fact. No proof whatsoever. He has hardly seen his children since. He has been forced to pay unreasonable amounts of alimony and child support and it's pretty much broken him. He has been contemplating ending things permanently. With the new evidence he gets from me, he has renewed hope. We both talked to my lawyer. She suggests he sits on the evidence until the meeting with my wife and her counsel. If he takes action now, it will show our hand that we have access to all their communications. My lawyer's goal is to divorce me and my wife as soon as possible, as smoothly as possible. Right now, I just hope I can get away from her. If she decides to fight, it can drag on for a long, long time. It's stressing me out. I just need to get free. I will post an update if I get a meeting or if we go directly to a disputed process in court. Opie's wife sounds increasingly delusional. It's a shame she isn't open to seeking help. Sometimes people who we think are our friends are really our enemies. Let the saga continue. Update 3. Sadly, the bizarre situation continues. The meeting with my lawyer and my soon-to-be ex-wife was yesterday afternoon. She showed up 30 minutes late. She didn't bring a lawyer, and she claims she doesn't have or need one. Instead, she brought one of her new harpy friends, censored until after hearing. My lawyer had given me very strict instructions on how to behave. I was not to react to anything they said in a negative way. If they addressed me, I was to respond in a non-confrontational manner and positively if I could. If my lawyer put one or both of her hands flat on the table, I needed to keep my mouth completely shut. So they show up late, no masks of course. The harpy, censored, tries to insult me and wind me up in any way she can think of. My soon-to-be ex-wife does the same. My lawyer is trying to get the discussion going on the subject at hand. Our divorce. But they are just joking around. They laughed at their own insults towards me a lot. It was real cringe to watch. It's clear now, my wife still believes this is all a ruse. That there is no way I can divorce her. In her mind, only she can divorce me, and only if she wants to. If she does, she will get everything. I just sat there thinking, what the F is going on? I didn't actually say anything of substance. I only responded a few times, and it was along the lines of, yes, you are probably right, or I really don't know. Finally, they ran a bit out of steam. My lawyer got the word and started putting forward the proposed settlement for an amicable divorce. One of the first things she said was that I was willing to be generous for a quick, peaceful resolution, that I would pay her a large lump sum of $60,000 for the equity in the house, investments, etc. My lawyer didn't even finish this sentence before my soon-to-be ex-wife got all excited together with her harpy friend. Nudged on by the horrific-looking harpy next to her, soon-to-be ex-wife 
wanted to know where to sign. My lawyer asked several times if my soon-to-be ex-wife didn't want to go over the rest of the agreement first, but no, soon-to-be ex-wife wanted to sign right away. She started talking about when she could expect to receive the money and that they needed to get to the pub. So my lawyer calls someone in, whispers something to them, and there was a flurry of activity. An older woman asked for our identity documents and we were asked to sign the copies. When we were done, the old lady stamped it and I later found out that she was a notary. My lawyer, almost standing on the palm of her hand at this point, thanked my soon-to-be ex-wife and the harpy and told them we were done. They left and my wife didn't even bring her copy of the agreement with her. She left it on the table. My lawyer looked at her flat hands and at me. She obviously didn't want me to say anything while they were in the building. When we could see them crossing the parking lot, my lawyer looked at me and said congratulations. Then she spoke at length about how this was the strangest session she ever had for a negotiated divorce. She told me she would send my soon-to-be ex-wife's copy to her after we do a hearing in front of the judge or if she gets a lawyer that asks for it. Until then, it's forgotten in my lawyer's drawer. So it looks like, on the surface, I will get through this divorce a lot easier than I first thought. Soon-to-be ex-wife can still hire legal representation and dispute this. My lawyer told me she would try to call in every possible favor she could think of to get me a hearing with a judge as soon as possible. It will probably be a video call. I have also hired a PI after the advice I got here on Reddit, and he got photos of my wife making out with two different guys and two different bars yesterday, and she went to a hotel with one of them. So I have lots of evidence piled up if I need it. I just hope it's enough if it comes to that. My wife signed to give me full custody, only a one-time payment, no spousal support, no nothing, just 60 k and I am free. Now, I just gotta find the money. I got a plan, and Bob offered to front me the entire amount if need be. I still don't feel like this is real. I fully expect her to pull, here is my aggressive lawyer, and I am accusing you of molesting the kids and domestic abuse, out of her hat. Lawyer told me to keep a very low profile, pay for everything I normally pay for, and don't rock the boat in any way at all. The advice is, don't talk to anyone we both know. Just sit still and wait. Don't respond to anything. Basically, zero initiative until the hearing. So now all I need to do is to be patient and hope for the best. Eek. Very cringe OP. She's very much digging her own grave. Update 4. So yesterday was the hearing. I'm basically divorced. It will take 4-6 to six months for the paperwork to be official, but at this point, there is basically nothing anyone can do to change the outcome. The only option is if me and my wife together stop it. I'm so effing tired. I haven't slept in, I don't know how many days. So if I am a bit all over the place, I'm sorry. I just need to get this all out. I need to vent. Hopefully, I can get some sleep after I type it out. My awesome lawyer got me an early hearing, just 12 days after submitting the paperwork. No doubt she called in some favors on this one. I am getting off track. From the weekend up until today has been insane. Friday morning, a whole bunch of police officers knocked at my door with a warrant to search the house. I was very confused. I was worried about the kids, so I asked if I could bring the kids outside while they did their search. Thankfully, they agreed to that. They didn't really tell me much, but I did get a copy of the warrant. I was so shaken up, I couldn't really make any sense of it. I guess everyone that said that my ex-wife's behavior was probably drug-related, it's safe to say that is at least a factor in this. The cops said about completely trashing my house. I called my lawyer and she talked to them, but the warrant was valid, so there wasn't anything that could be done at the time. I didn't think about it when it happened, but I have cameras everywhere now, in case I get wrongfully accused. I have video and sound of everything. I could possibly make a claim later if I want to. To be honest, I don't really know if I have the energy or will for that. Maybe I just put a line over it and move on. I didn't know it then, but X and her three harpy friends drove my car while high and drunk and crashed into a house at high speed. They were all arrested, all of them drunk, and they all had drugs in and on their body. They were pretty roughed up by the crash. The one in the passenger seat is in critical condition. They don't know if she will even make it. The lead harpy, let's call her Henrietta. She is the one that bragged about screwing over and lying about her ex-husband in court. Let's call her ex-husband Henry. Me and Henry have become really good friends. I will get back to him. Thankfully, they didn't find anything from the search. I gave my statement that my ex doesn't live here anymore. She lives with her parents. I don't know what she is doing. No, I didn't give Henrietta permission to drive my car, etc. When I got back in the house, I just broke down. Everything was completely trashed. It was just the last straw, I guess. The only thing I could think of was to call my dad who brought me and the kids home to stay with my mom. Dad then got a whole group together, 26 friends and relatives. While I was sobbing on the back porch, eating my mom's amazing comfort food, feeling sorry for myself, 
They completely cleaned and fixed my entire house. They did every single room, clothes, dishes, furniture, even washing the ceiling and walls. It's never been this clean. They even fixed all the little things, like loose door handles, etc. I just couldn't believe they would do such a thing for me. I have no idea how I can ever repay them. I went from suicidal to feeling pretty good over the weekend thanks to them. Cops found more drugs at Henrietta's house and her boyfriend wasn't there. No babysitter either, just the kids alone. The kids were taken by CPS and Henry won temporary emergency custody Saturday after showing the judge the chat logs. Combined with the abandonment and piles of drugs thing, he got custody without much difficulty. Henry is over the moon happy. He has hardly seen his kids in the last five years. He hadn't been raising money to fight Henrietta in court when this happened. He still needs to go to court to make it permanent, but the odds are really good at this point. Everybody thinks Henrietta will have to serve time. If her friend doesn't make it probably serious time. After that, he will try for child support and compensation for all the crap Henrietta did. He isn't expecting much on this though. And to be honest, I think he doesn't want to waste his time fighting in court. He wants to be with his kids and make sure they have a good life. It's pretty clear Henrietta has been very neglectful toward them. Bob has been a champ and set Henry up in a rental apartment through a friend. I have come to realize that I know practically nothing about Bob's private or professional life. I intend to remedy that. Anyway, I'm off track again. Henrietta was at the wheel when she drove off the road and into a house. They were all pretty banged up, and due to the situation, the alcohol and the drugs, search warrants were issued for everyone's residence. X is still registered with her residence at my house. I decided on Sunday that I am selling this house and moving away ASAP. I'm afraid this will probably happen again. On Sunday, I get a call from her parents. Their house got searched as well. They had visited their daughter in jail on Saturday and they no longer trust anything she tells them. Long story short, they came over to talk on Sunday and it turns out she has been lying to them about everything. The night she has been out partying and cheating, she told them that she was staying with me and we were trying to work things out. They had no idea what was actually going on or what she has done to me and the kids. They knew she cheated, but they believed it was a one-time drunken mistake. That's basically what she told them. On Monday, my wife calls me to try to get me to post bail. It's $15,000 and her parents have already told her no. After talking to my lawyer, she made some papers that the bail is subtracted from the settlement until she shows up in court and the bail is released. The agreement included her mother as a custodial of the remaining amount. My lawyer didn't want my wife to have any excuse for not attending the hearing. That's why she wanted me to get her out. X didn't really have a choice and she signed. She was released Monday afternoon. From what her parents tell me, she refused to comply with the terms they had for her to continue living there. Terms like stop doing drugs, commit to rehab, open everything policy, drop the bad friends, etc. She apparently left their house on Tuesday to stay with some of her new friends. She didn't show for the hearing, and after showing the judge everything, including the events over the weekend, I won full custody. The settlement is according to the agreement we made. It was quick, only 30 minutes. It will take four to six months to go through the paper mill. But in reality, it's done. There isn't really anything that can be done to stop this now. That brings us to today. I wasn't able to sleep. Everybody was congratulating me and treating me like I had some major victory, but it sure as hell doesn't feel like I won anything. This is just pain. I still love my wife. I know it's over and there's absolutely no way back. Still, she was my best friend, my soulmate up until recently, and even though I feel my love for her has been mortally wounded, it's still there, and it hurts like a mother effer. There are no winners in this. I lose, my wife loses, my kids lose. I don't really have the words. It feels like I am being asked to celebrate that I have lost both my legs. But because I took action, one of my legs could be cut below the knee, while the other still was cut above. When people congratulate me, it feels almost like that. Like they are commending me for saving half a kneecap while losing both my legs. So I can't really sleep, and when I do, I am torn through terrible nightmares. They wake me up, drenched in cold sweat. I'm complaining a bit here, sorry. Anyway, today I get a call from the hospital that my ex is hospitalized. I am still her emergency contact, and she is still on my health insurance. There has been an altercation. She has lost some teeth, broken jaw, and she will need to stay for observation a few days. I bring her parents, and when I get there, it turns out some of her new friends have beaten her up pretty badly. Ward got out that Henry had chat logs of Henrietta bragging about what she did to Henry from my wife's phone. They assumed that my wife had given the logs to Henry. This resulted in them beating her up and kicking her out. Amazingly, she still didn't understand that I have access to monitor her phone. I will keep on like I do now, pay for insurance, her phone, etc. All the way up until I get the papers in my hand. I just won't believe it until I hold it in front of me. She has nothing now. 
She asked if she could move back home. I simply told her, no way in hell. Her mother isn't giving her a single penny unless she gets clean and stays clean for at least one year. They offered her to live with them on the previous strict terms. If she doesn't accept, I don't see how she will manage. It's the first time I have seen any form of regret from her since this started, but I think it's regret that she can no longer continue with her craziness. She did say, I am sorry I ruined everything, but I don't think it's genuine. She hardly looked me in the eyes while I was there. It hurt seeing her like this. I felt like I wanted to protect her, but she's an adult. Her behavior is dangerous and erratic and I need to protect my kids. Apart from that, she didn't ask about the hearing. She didn't ask about the condition of her critical injured friend. She basically just sat there seemingly irritated. I still don't understand this. She has lost everything. She has destroyed her family and caused a lot of pain for a lot of people. And for what? A buzz and some random sex? I'm going completely no contact until she has been clean for a long time. I just can't deal with all the crazy. I'm so sorry, OP. You may never understand her behavior or what's going on in her head, and that's okay. Sometimes we don't get closure. Your ex is deeply troubled, and the only person that can help her is herself. Update 5. So a lot of people PM me for an update. I was going to post one yesterday, but I just didn't have the energy. I'm kind of depressed and very, very tired. I hardly ever sleep, and when I do, I am plagued by nightmares. Good news is kids are doing better. My dad is a champ. I don't know what to do without him. We went to his cabin to ski a bit this weekend. Me, him, and the kids. It was great. I have basically no contact with my ex. I did talk to one of her harpy friends, the one that was in critical condition. She woke up, but she is in terrible shape. I talked to her nurse, and she was sad that no one had bothered to look in on her while she was there. They had contacted her family, and they had just refused to see her. I am worried the people that beat up my ex will come for me and the kids, so I asked via the nurse if I could talk to her and she agreed. I know I shouldn't, but I felt I needed to ask her about what happened since my wife started working with them. She started off asking if I wanted a BJ for 20 bucks, so that wasn't awkward at all. I offered her 50 in exchange for information I needed. The Harpy friends are all hardcore drug users, addicts. Henrietta dragged my wife into their group against the wishes of the other two and convinced her to try drugs and party with them. They sold sexual favors to get money for drugs. Henrietta is the lead on this. They all preach this strong feminist, my own body stuff. But as she put it, it's all BS to protect our own imagined egos. What we really do is prostitute ourselves for money to buy drugs. My wife bought into the BS first and it didn't take long until she was addicted, just like the rest of them. Once she was hooked, she too eventually started selling sex to pay for drugs. Not easy hearing that the person you loved more than anything turned herself into a sex worker to meet her drug addiction. It makes sense why all she wanted was the money now. From what she tells me, it's mainly meth. No one visited her because she has stolen, cheated, abused, and lied to everyone in her life, and no one wants anything to do with her. She told me, without even blinking, how sad she was that she survived. She has zero hope for the future, and she looks like walking death without her makeup. It was painful. I was devastated just listening to her. I cried a lot for my wife's sake. I'm not excusing her. She made the choice to play with this crap and she lost. Now she will pay the price. She also told me about all the guys that beat up my ex-wife. I will get back to this later. Henrietta has been charged with death threats, resisting arrest, drug possession, prostitution, drug trafficking, child abuse and neglect, DUI, property damage, and auto theft. She is denied bail as a flight risk. She will probably go away for a while. At least I hope she will. Before I go on, I would like to thank those of you that reached out with experience dealing with addicts. Many warned me that my ex might try to end herself now that the walls are closing in. You were right. She tried to deliberately OD. I had talked to her father about it beforehand, that there was a high chance she might try something. We decided to try to monitor her closely. Luckily, she still doesn't know that I have live information from her mobile. While we were at the cabin on Saturday, I get a message from her. It reads like a suicide note. She tells me about the addiction, the prostitution, how she let everybody down, and that she will do the only thing she can do, etc. I immediately called her dad and because I have the mobile monitor, I also have her location. Her father rushes out and finds her unconscious on a park bench. She is immediately taken to the hospital and pumped. She is also very hypothermic. I dread to think of what would happen if he arrived just a little later. They have her on methadone for now. Her father has successfully become her appointed guardian. She can no longer object to treatment. Her father had her forcefully committed to a rehab center and she will go through a sedated detox. I don't know when, but probably this week. 
Her father was appointed not because she OD'd, but because she abandoned her children. Apparently abandoning your children proves that you are not rational, while trying to end it is okay. Anyway, thankfully I haven't had a chance to cancel her life insurance yet, so she will get treatment. I have offered my ex-father-in-law to help with the finances as long as my ex isn't told that I am. I have been very scared that the guys that beat up my wife was going to come after me and the kids. Remember, Henry presented chat logs in court that they believe my wife gave to Henry. I talked to Henry about it and he decided that he would fix this since he benefited from the disclosure. I don't know if I mentioned this, but Henry is an angry meat mountain of a man. He grew up on a farm carrying stuff since he was a kid, so he looks like he can rip the average man in half. He bends down walking through doorways. He has a crew cut and some facial scars. Let's just say he is very intimidating if you don't know him. In reality, he is infinitely patient, gentle, and kind. I don't doubt he will use force if he finds it necessary, but for him, it's a last resort. Anyway, he went to the guy's apartment, a real crap hole by the way. He grabbed the two guys by the neck and told them that Henrietta had given him the chat logs, and since they hurt someone he knew, they had a choice to make. Go with him to the police and confess everything related to the assault. Or, two, face him right there and that they should expect some very painful permanent injuries if they chose option two. As he told it to me, he let them know that he was very hopeful that they would choose option two. They apparently couldn't get to the police station fast enough. Needless to say, I no longer worry about them. I have found a new apartment and I will be moving soon. Bob, once again, came through. All in all, I am very depressed. This is heavy on my soul. What keeps me going is my friends and family, and I know I need to stay strong for the kids. My heart breaks for my ex. Despite everything, I don't regret marrying her. I still love her, but I know we can never be back together. She isn't the person she used to be, and there is just too much pain between us. Despite all the pain recently, we had a very good life before that. I wouldn't have my children if it wasn't for her and wouldn't give them up for anything. I know it's going to hurt for a long time. I hope I am strong enough to get through it. Strangely enough, news of my wife's addiction has helped my kids deal with it. It's much easier to talk about how mommy is sick and it's going to take a long time for her to get well. She still loves them, etc, etc. Right now, I am sad and tired. Henry is here with the kids. We are going to watch Madagascar 3, I think. I'm trying to make as many good new memories as possible. Henry is doing the same and his and my kids look like they are doing a lot better now. I think we will be okay. Thank you everyone for all your help. This will be my last post here, I think. Last update. X passed away. OD while in rehab. We don't know how she even got the drugs. She must have taken them while inside somehow, but no one actually knows how. One doctor speculates that she has swallowed a bag or something and that it burst. I won't be posting anymore or answering comments. Thank you everyone that provided helpful suggestions and comments. I'm so sorry for your family's loss, OP. For many people, grief is the process of mourning the loss of a loved one, moving through the painful yearning to have them be back by your side. But what if that emptiness has been there for a while? How do you grieve for a conflicted relationship? The first thing you can do and should do when losing a loved one to addiction is a promise to follow up each guilty, self-hatred thought with, this was not my fault. As hard as it is to believe, it is the truth. Addiction is a serious, often deadly disease, but like any disease, no one person is to blame. Conflicted relationships can often complicate pain in the wake of death. It can be more challenging, grieving, and you may fixate on the not so pleasant memories of the time and distance spent apart. Invite these feelings in and open up with others about them. The more you hold in, the more damage you can cause. Sending love and light your way, OP.